Hello and welcome to another tutorial on Open Sesame. In this tutorial, we're going to take a look at how we can implement counterbalancing inside of our experiments. We're going to look at two particular examples, one in which we'll have two conditions that we want to counterbalance across participants, and a second example, which will be a little bit more complex, where we'll have a look at how we can counterbalance across three or more conditions. So let's have a look at how we can implement a simple counterbalancing system inside of Open Sesame. Let's say that we want half our participants to receive the order block one followed by block two, and the other particip half of participants to receive the order block two followed by block one. A simple way of doing this is actually we can look at the subject number and see whether it's odd or whether it's even. If it's an odd number, we'll give them the order block one followed by block two, and if it's an even number, we'll give them block two followed by block one ensuring that half our participants have one order and the other half have the other. To demonstrate this, I've got a simple experiment loaded up already. This experiment will it'll display some instructions on the screen to the participant. It will sit and wait for a uh, space bar to be pressed before starting. We then have block number one, which just contains one particular trial. I'll open up and show you. It's got one variable, MSG, and this one trial just puts the message block one onto the screen. We then have some second block instructions. So we'd normally say that's the end of block one, get ready for block two, wait for the space bar to be pressed, and then we'll start block two. And block two also has just one variable in it, MSG with the message block two. Then we have a goodbye message, say thanks to the participant, wait for a space bar, and then quit. So if I run this experiment right now, so I run it in a window with subject number one, So here we have it with the uh, instructions that go in there. We have block one, instructions for the second block, and then we have block two, and then the goodbye message. And that's the experiment. That's exactly the order we would want for odd number participants, but not for the even number participants. Now, a very crude way of sorting this out is that we could actually create a second version of the script and literally just move around uh, the order of these two blocks. So we could put block one up here, and we could put block one down here, and that would create the opposite order for us. Put that in the right place, that's better. Uh, it would create the opposite uh, order for us, but then we'd have to remember to open up each particular script and make sure that we have uh, the right script for the right participant and so on. Can get a little bit out of hand that, and it's much more simple to let Open Sesame take care of this for us. And we can actually make use of a variable that's built inside of Open Sesame called subject parity. So I put the show variable inspector window, and you can see it down here, subject parity. It takes two values, odd if the participant number was odd, and even if it was an even numbered participant. And we can actually use this as one of the conditions for running a particular block. So if we have a look in the main experiment sequence at the moment, let's put these back in the right order. Right way around like so. At the moment, we always run every single object inside of the experiment. So we always run the instructions, we always run the space response, then we always run block one, second block instructions, and so on. What we can actually do is specify that we only want certain blocks to run depending upon a certain condition, i.e. that that condition has been met. And what we can basically do is tell Open Sesame only run a block if the subject parity is even or if the subject parity is odd. So what we can do is if we add in a second copy of block one and a second copy of block two, they appear down here at the bottom. I'll put them together in two pairs. So that now the experiment is ordered instructions followed by block one and block two, then the second block instructions followed by block one and block two, which essentially just give us uh, the same order done over twice. We can though, specify certain conditions about whether we want to run that particular block. And what we can say here is run this block one here if the subject parity is odd, i.e. it's an odd numbered participant, and run this block two here only if the subject parity was even, so it's an even numbered participant. We can flip that over in the second pairing and say run this block one here only if the participant parity was even and then run this block two here if the subject parity was odd. And the way we do that is we put that into the uh, condition box over here. And remember subject parity is a variable, so we need to specify it inside of the square brackets. So I'll just type in subject parity 
equals odd. And then for the next one, I can type in subject parity equals even. So first time up here, uh, it's going to, if you've got an odd number participant, it's going to run block one and ignore block two. So then if I come down here and flip those two over, so that uh, for even number participants, they get block two followed by block one. So I then need to say subject parity equals even. And then for the second copy of block two, I need to say subject parity equals odd. So just to walk our way through this, if we've got an even, uh, sorry, an odd number participant, uh, we'll have some instructions on the screen. We'll come down to block one. Because we've got an odd numbered participant, it will run block one. However, it won't run block two because it will only run that if we've got an even numbered participant. So this is going to be skipped. We'll get the second block instructions. Then we'll get uh, block one won't be run because we've got an odd number participant, but block two will be run because the subject parity is odd. If you imagine now we've got participant number two, we'd have instructions followed by block one being ignored because we've got an even number participant and this is only going to be run if the subject parity is odd. However, block two will be run because the subject parity is even. So let's do a quick demonstration of that. I'll say give subject number one. So this should give us the order block one followed by block two. And we get block one instructions, the second block, block two. And goodbye. I'll try running it now with subject number two, which should give us the opposite order of the blocks. And so there's the instructions. We now get block two first. There's the instructions, the second block. And now we get block one followed by the goodbye message. So that gives us a, a nice simple way of implementing a simple counterbalancing system inside of OpenSesame. Sometimes we want to implement a more complex counterbalancing system. Let's say, for example, if we have three blocks that we want to counterbalance across participants, maybe perhaps using reduced Latin square design. That would be that participant number one gets the block order one, two, three, Participant number two will get the order two, three, one, and participant number three will get the block order three, one, two. For participant number four, the sequence will reset, so they get the sequence one, two, three. Now, because we've got more than two blocks here, we can't use the subject parity variable to, to help us out. After all, subject parity could only contain two values, odd or even. That works fine if we've only got two block orders, but now we have three block orders to worry about, so we have to use something slightly different. Uh, to determine what that block order is going to be. To determine that block order, we'll actually use a bit of arithmetic, namely the modulo function. I'll do a demonstration of this using the uh, debug window, because that lets me type some Python code in directly. Modulo arithmetic basically is, you can think of it like the remainder from a, a, a division. So if we have, uh, say, 3 modulo 3, it's like saying 3 divided by 3 is 0, uh, sorry, 1 remainder 0. If we had 1 divided by 3, it would be 0 remainder 1. Uh, in this particular case, the uh, result of 1 modulo 3 would be that remainder value, the 1. In the case of 2, 2 divided by 3, or 2 modulo 3, it would be 2 as the remainder, and that's what we return to us. Um, if we use 4, for example, uh, 4 divided by 3 would be 1 remainder 1. So the modulo function would give us the return of 1 there for the remainder. Uh, as you can see, we actually end up with three numbers that basically come out of this uh, modulo division. Uh, we either get 0 when it's a multiple of 3, uh, we get 1 in the case of 1 modulo 3, or we get 2 in the case of 2 modulo 3. And we can use these three values uh, to determine uh, which block order we want to give the participant. Now in Python, the modulo uh, function is defined by the percentage symbol. So do the demonstration down here of 1 modulo 3 gives us the answer 1 because that's uh, 1 modulo 3 is uh, well it's like the 1 divided by 3 which would be 0 remainder 1 uh, we can use 2 modulo 3 gives the result 2 and 3 modulo 3 gives us 0 if I put 4 in we're back at 1 again 
So we've got this sort of cycle we've got here going 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0 for all the possible participant numbers uh, that we've got. And we can actually exploit this to determine what our block order is going to be in our experiment. So let's have a look at how we can actually implement this inside of OpenSesame. Let's get rid of the debug window, I don't need that. I've got a simple experiment opened up already, um, which uh, contains this first thing in here is a inline script object, which I'll open up. And it contains this bit of Python code in here. It takes the form of an if, else if, else statement. And basically what we're doing here is looking for these certain conditions to be met. So we're saying if self get subject number modulo three equals one, then if it does indeed equal one, B1 should be set to zero, B2 should be set to one, and B3 should be set to two. We'll talk a little bit about this B1, B2, and B3 uh, in a moment. First of all, let's just focus on this bit up here, to see what that actually means. Subject number is a variable, uh, just like things like um, subject parity was in the simple example. But in the actual inline script object, we can't just stick subject number inside of those square brackets. Instead, what we have to do is use this bit of code here, this function, that basically means this experiment, then go and get the variable called subject number. That will return the number of the subject number. We then perform the modular arithmetic on it, and we'll see what the outcome is, and does it equal one. If it does equal one, then we set the values as we set up here. However, if it does not equal one, let's say for example, the subject number was two, two modulo three, as we saw earlier on, is actually two, we'll actually come down to this next statement, which is else if, doing the same bit of uh, arithmetic here, except this time, does it equal two? In the case of subject number two, yes, it will do. So B1 will equal two, B2 will equal zero, and B3 will equal one. And there's only one other option, so I haven't put an else if in, I've just simply said else if these two conditions, so this condition here and this condition here are not true, i.e. the result out the modular division is not one or two, then just set B1 to one, B2 to two, and B3 to zero. This will happen in cases where the subject number is a multiple of three. So let's have a look at what this B1, B2, and B3 actually mean. You might have guessed they stand for block one, block two, and block three. The zero, one, two uh, in, that these values are being set to actually indicate uh, which order we're running the block, or more precisely, which block is run first. In all three cases, whichever gets set the value of zero will be the first block, uh, block run. So in the case of uh, a subject number one or four or seven and so on, the first block to be run will be B1. For subject number two, the first block that will be run is B2. And for subject number three, the first block that will be run will be block three. Then the one indicates the second block, so and then the two indicates the third block that's going to be run. The reason we use 0, 1, 2 here, by the way, and not 1, 2, 3, will become a bit clearer a little later on. Then we also have to set these values uh, to be experiment-wide, uh, because otherwise we'd only have access to these in inline scripts. And actually what we want to do is access these particular values, this B1, B2, and B3, from outside of an inline script. The reason for doing this means that we only need to have one inline script in order to uh, do this counterbalancing. So to make them across the experiment, uh, available across the experiment, we have to say experiment or exp set the variable b1 to the value b1 that we've defined up here, and the value b2 to b2, and the value b3 to b3. So that just makes sure that these values are available experiment wide. So just to briefly recap this particular screen, if we run this uh, script and the subject number is number one, uh, the very, very first condition up here will be satisfied. So subject number modulo three, it will indeed equal one. So we'll set B1 to zero, B2 to one, and B3 to two. However, if we have the subject number two, it won't be the first condition that's satisfied, it will actually be the second condition. So that will be subject number, i.e. two, modulo three will indeed equal two in which case we'll set B1 to two, B2 to zero, and B3 to one. And in all other cases, basically where the subject number modulo three is actually gonna equal zero, then B1 will be set to one, B2 will be set to two, and B3 will be set to zero. And then finally, we just make sure that these variables are available across the entire experiment.
So let's take a look at what the rest of this experiment is going to be doing. After we've determined what the block order is going to be uh, for our participants, we have some instructions that will be displayed upon the screen to the participant. And then we'll sit there and wait for them to press the space bar to actually get started. We then have this loop object called main loop. It doesn't seem to contain very much. All it really is is just three cycles uh, with no variables set in it. And the reason it's been set up this way is what we want uh, to happen is to run through three particular blocks of the experiment. It doesn't matter which order we're going in at the moment, we just have three blocks that we want to run. So you can consider main loop to be sort of the control block, the ones that can control these three particular cycles of the experiment. Uh, and so by setting the block up this way, it's going to run this sequence called main sequence three times. I click on main sequence now, and you can see we've got three blocks inside of the experiment, block one, block two, and block three. Uh, these are set up just to display a simple message on the screen. So we have this one variable called msg, which is block one for block one. It says block two for block two, and for block three, it says block three. All three blocks run the same trial sequence, which displays this text render display on the screen that says this is msg, in which case that would say this is block one, block two, or block three. Uh, towards the end of the experiment, we have a goodbye message and after we've presented that goodbye message, we want the computer to wait for the space bar to be pressed before we actually finish. Before explaining how we actually implement the counterbalancing, uh, to make this nice and clear, let's just have a look at what happens if we run this study right now. We have main loop, which contains three cycles, so it's going to call main sequence three times. Main sequence contains three blocks, block one, block two, block three each of which are going to display a message on the screen that says this is block one, this is block two, and this is block three, respectively. So what we should see is uh, some instructions come up on the screen, followed by the message, this is block one, this is block two, this is block three, as it runs through main sequence for the first time. Then, because we're running through main loop three times, we'll actually get this is block one, this is block two, this is block three, for a second time. And then we'll get it a third time because we're running through this loop three times. So it'll be this is block one, this is block two, this is block three, the third time. So what we're going to see is basically messages for nine blocks will appear on the screen. Then we get our goodbye message and we'll sit and wait for the space bar to be pressed. So I'll quickly just run this right now just to demonstrate uh, what we actually get. So there's our instructions. So this is the block one the first time around we've been through that main, uh, main loop. Uh, block two, block three, then we get block one again, followed by block two, followed by block three, and thirdly, block one, block two, and block three, followed by the goodbye message. The next thing we need to do, though, is to prevent block one, block two, and block three always running on every particular sequence. What we basically want to do is change the values on the right-hand side that say run if, where they're currently set to always, which is the default. We want to put some condition in there that says only run block one if certain conditions are met, only run block two if certain conditions are met, and only run, run block three if certain conditions are met. This is the reason now, coming back to what we talked about at the beginning, about why we use the values 0, 1, and 2 uh, for setting our block order. The reason is this particular sequence called main sequence. Every time it's run, there is a variable that's called count main sequence. I'll show you that in the variable inspector. Got some space for it. So it's over here. Count main sequence. This value will increment every time main sequence is run. Now the thing is that the very first time it runs main sequence, main count main sequence will have the value zero. The second time we run it, it will have the value 1, and the third time we run it, it will have the value 2. This is the reason we use these numbers 0, 1, 2, and not the numbers 1, 2, and 3. So what we want to basically say to Open Sesame is that if count main sequence is 0, we need to look at what particular block order we've got, and then run that block if indeed we should be running it for that particular uh, counterbalancing sequence. Now we don't actually have to use any more inline code here. We can actually use this uh, run if condition box here and actually put some Python code in directly. If you're going to put Python code in directly, you need to remember to put the equal sign uh, at the start of the condition. I've actually got uh, the condition we're going to put in in a separate 
text file so it's easier to display on the screen. We have the equals sign, and to worry about this one up here at the moment because this is the one we're going to use for block one. Equal sign, so it indicates to Open Sesame where you're going to use some uh, uh, Python code in here. We're then going to get the value of B1 that we set earlier on, and we're going to see if that's equal to the value of count main sequence. It's probably easier to explain this one with a concrete example. If we go back to the determine block loop and uh, or block order, and we consider the case where we've got the subject number one, B1 is going to be set to zero. This means, if we go back to our inline script that we're going to have, whenever uh, B1 has been set to zero and K count main sequence is also zero, then we want to run that particular block. In the case of uh, B2, for example, uh, on the first time round we run through the sequence and count main sequence is set to zero, well B2 is actually set to one, so this condition will not be met. And likewise this one here for block three, count main sequence when that is zero is actually set to two for this participant here, so it won't be run on that particular loop through the main sequence. However, on the second time through we go through the sequence, count main sequence will now take the value one. That will basically mean then that the self get B1, which is going to evaluate to zero, and self get count main sequence, which will evaluate to one, will no longer be true. So block one won't run. However, if we look at self get B2, uh, B2 has been set to one, and our count main sequence on the second time through is indeed going to be the value one. So this condition here, will be satisfied and this block will run. And then look at the third example here, self get B3, which has been set to two, does it equal the count main sequence, which on the second time through is one? The answer is no, so this block here will not be run. Then the final time we run through, uh, we'll be getting the value of B1, which will be zero again, but this time count main sequence will be two. It's always incrementing every time we go through the sequence. Uh, B2, which is set to 1, will not equal 2 either. However, B3, which has been set to 2, will equal uh, the count of the main sequence. So that block will be run. The result of this is that every time we go through that main sequence, only one of the blocks is going to be run, uh, and the other two are not. They're going to be skipped over because the value that we've set in here does not equal the main sequence. So just to clarify, the reason we use these 0, 1, and 2 is we're actually referring to this value here for count main sequence. That's why we're using those and not 1, 2, or 3. So what I'll do is I'll copy and paste these into the main sequence. The variable inspector. Paste that in. Let's go back and get the next one. Last one. And paste that in. So these blocks are only going to run if these conditions have actually been satisfied, i.e., the result of this particular comparison is true. So in the first time round, we run for participant number one, uh, block one, which is being set to B1, it's been set to zero, will indeed equal the main sequence count because the first time round is zero but it won't satisfy block two because B2 has been set to one, which is not the same value as zero, which is the count main sequence. The same thing goes for block three. So the first time we run through, only that one block is gonna be run, block one. Second time we run through when count main sequence has changed, it's now the value of one, that's gonna equal the value B2. So block two will run and the other two won't. And then finally, the third time we run through, B3, which was set to the value two, will then equal the count main sequence, which was also now set to two on the third time through the uh, loop. So let's just try running this and see what happens. So I use the subject number one. So this should give us the instructions followed by this is block one, this is block two, this is block three. We then should have the goodbye message. So let's see what we get. There's the instructions. This is block one, this is block two, this is block three and then the goodbye message. Let's try it if we run participant number two. Remember participant number two should have the sequence two, three, and then block one to finish off. 
So we get that. So there's the instructions. And then they get this is block two, this is block three, and this is block one, followed by the goodbye message. And to finish it off, we'll run it with participant number three. And they should get the order three, one, and two, and three, one, and then block two to finish off with the goodbye message. So we say no. So that's how we can uh, implement some more ca uh, complex counterbalancing inside of OpenSesame using minimal amounts of inline Python code. It may seem a little complicated to get your head around it the first time you start looking at it, but essentially what we're just doing here is using some of the inbuilt uh, variables that are inside of OpenSesame. In this particular example, it is this count main sequence uh, that we're actually exploiting to see, okay, which cycle through the sequence are we and which block should be running on that particular sequence. And that particular value is determined in the inline script depending upon the subject number. So hopefully that gets you started on thinking about how you use these more complicated examples uh, inside of your experiments.